Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic number eight, reinforcement techniques from our field supervision series. So when we talk about reinforcement, we are talking about delivering or um, the consequence that follows a behavior that will increase the likelihood of that behavior occurring again in the future. So knowing that good consequences or uh, reinforcing consequences result in a behavior continuing, we also want to know what can make those um, things that get delivered, what can make them be potentially reinforcers? So, um, and how can we be more effective with using those reinforcers? So one acronym to help remember four key principles to effectively use reinforcement would be DISC, D-I-S-C. So DISC, um, we're going to talk through each of these, but the D stands for deprivation. Um, now, when we talk about deprivation, we mean that reinforcers must be used for use as reinforcers only. That doesn't mean that we're taking away things that an individual already uses in their day or relies upon. We are talking about adding something that is not already in their environment that makes it more enjoyable. So a learner may play with cars, but when you play with them, you guys make sound effects and you can make them do cool tricks and you can crash them really loud and you can set up the track really cool. And those pieces are things that the learner doesn't have access to the rest of the day, they don't have your engagement with that activity. So deprivation is about making sure that the things that you are choosing to use as reinforcers are things that are extra above and beyond and um, that the learner doesn't already have um, a whole lot of the time, because if they do, then the individual might um, not value it as much because they uh, can get it on their own. They already have it a lot. Um, again, this doesn't mean we take stuff away that they already have. It means that we bring in new stuff that makes it more fun and things that, um, we are making extra rewarding. I stands for immediate. So if we are going to uh, deliver something in hopes that it is a reinforcer, it needs to be delivered quickly, like immediately when the behavior that we'd like to see increase occurs. Um, if you delay too long, then the learner may not make the connection between what they did and then the reward. So we can't um, sit here and say, oh, and by the way, here's this for something you did way earlier in the day. Um, unless our learner has really demonstrated that they have that continuity. So I might be able to um, understand if my boss gives me a recognition award uh, three weeks after the project was done, but it probably isn't going to directly affect my behavior of whatever it was that I did that rec recognition award, uh, whatever I did for that recognition award. It's more effective it's, if it's immediate. The closer in time, the stronger that pairing. S stands for size. So we do need to make sure that we are being equitable in the size or amount of a reinforcer that we are giving. And that goes both ways. Um, we don't want to have the learner do a huge, long, complicated, difficult task and then only give them like half of a Skittle or five seconds with their preferred toy, like it's not worth it. I wouldn't work for that long for something so little. So we don't need to set our learners up for that as well. Um, on the flip side, if they do something that's 
mastered, very easy for them. They're very fluent with the skill. And then we give them um, a huge, uh, you know, 45 minutes on the computer for something that was super simple for them and didn't take very long, then that's going to be like overkill. They're going to habituate to that reinforcer faster because they're getting it a lot more than, um, than they need given the amount of work that they did. So you have to find what is equitable, kind of like you would um, pay to see a movie. Like there's certain amounts that um, would be beneficial, you would pay for, and other amounts you're like, no, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do that. Um, and uh, same thing. We want to find what's, what's an equitable amount. Um, now, I also use the term habituation. Um, so satiation is geared around food. Um, and we don't always use food. We shouldn't be relying upon food as uh, reinforcers for the majority of our learners. Um, and even with non-human studies, uh, they don't... Um, satiation suggests that there is a fullness that no more can be had. But in studies with um, animals, they have found that if they change something um, and then represent that food, even though the organism had stopped responding and we would say that they're like satiated on it. Um, if you change something about the presentation, oh, they start responding again for the same thing. So it's um, better classified as habituated to a particular reinforcer. They're, um, they've gotten used to it. It doesn't maintain the same power that it did. But if you shift things up, then it can still have more value or that value can increase again. And then C in DISC is contingent. And this means that um, in order to reinforce effectively that those things that we are using as reinforcers are delivered when and only when the targeted behavior occurs. So I'm only going to say, you know, provide a praise statement. Thanks, you did that. That's awesome. Um, when they do the activity, um, if they put in effort, and we'll talk about reinforcing attending and approximations, but if they put in effort, then I might praise the effort, um, but I'm differentiating between what it is that I'm praising. If somebody is um, engaging in a behavior that is overly adapted for that situation and, and not what we want to see, we don't want to deliver the reinforcer at that moment. We want to save the reinforcer until the individual is engaging in that more, uh, th that targeted behavior that we're looking for. All right, so reinforcer delivery. Um, with rare exception, tangible reinforcers should always be delivered with praise or other social reinforcement. Um, our goal is to help individuals be motivated by the natural contingencies that are in their environment. And one of the most common natural contingencies is going to be social reinforcement in the form of praise, um, in the form of proximity, um, engagement. Um, so those should always be paired with any tangible item that we might be using as a reinforcer now, while our learner is not yet Yet, um, engaging with those more social reinforcers, where those social reinforcers are not powerful enough yet. We should be pairing them so that they eventually do um, hold value for that learner. Um, depending upon your learner, your praise might be very loud and animated. Yeah, you did it. High five. Way to go. Or it could be more quiet and soothing. Thank you. Nice job thumbs up. Um, you want to make sure that, again, this is going to be something that we want our learner to enjoy and is not an aversive. So you want to adapt your praise to be what the learner finds enjoyable. If your learner 
covers their ears every time you praise them, then that is not good praise. That is an aversive to them. And you are not helping them to learn to value any social interaction or that social um, reinforcement. So you need to change your behavior. So to match what the learner finds enjoyable, it might just be hand signals. It might just be close by. It might be a smile or just some eye contact and a nod. Whatever the learner likes, that is what you should be delivering. You want to vary your praise statements so that you don't just say the same thing over and over again. That can get boring, that can get dull. We don't wanna hear the same thing over and over again. Why would our learners want to? Um, so mix it up, use different phrasing, um, come up with a list of a bunch of cool adjectives that you can use to describe the behaviors instead of always saying, good job or way to go. You want to mix it up. All right. You did it. That's amazing. Super fantastic. You've got it. Way to go, buddy. Um, whatever statements and uh, that you can um, put in some variety. Uh, same type of thing with descriptive praise versus generic praise. If we just say good job or way to go, we aren't specifying what in particular was good and that we would like to see more of, right? So descriptive praise statements are going to specify that target behavior that you're acknowledging. Wow, I really like how much effort you put into your homework. Oh, you did an awesome job with this um, art. This looks amazing. Praise, uh, using descriptive praise can help the learner identify what it is that you want to see more of um, instead of maybe wondering like, well, they said good, but I don't know what particular part was good. Um, so how do we determine effective reinforcers, right? Um, we want to constantly evaluate the effectiveness of our reinforcer. So we've talked about preference assessments already. So you may need to go back and conduct some more preference assessments to find things that are motivating now. Um, you should be doing preference assessments on a frequent basis. Um, you also may need to evaluate whether an item is just preferred or neutral versus actually motivating behavior. So um, something may be accepted, I may take it, or I may spend my time engaging with it, um, but it's not actually improving the behavior. It's not actually changing the behavior in any way. Um, so it's not functioning as a reinforcer. Um, the learner might have um, habituated to it outside of your session. Um, they may actually have more access than you thought you did, um, or they may, um, uh, want to engage with it in a different way. So you need to evaluate the effectiveness of your reinforcer, offer more choices, um, conduct more preference assessments, uh, follow the learner's lead, let them show you what they're interested in, and then build off of that. You'll also need to consider how often you are reinforcing. Um, we should generally be uh, reinforcing frequently with new and difficult tasks, but we always want to be moving from um, more extrinsic reinforcement that might not occur in the natural environment to more uh, natural uh, consequences, natural contingencies. Um, so we don't want to uh, rely upon edibles or tangibles um, if we can transition to uh, something else, more social engagement or social praise or a token system. Um, if you run into uh, the learners not learning the new skill, one of the first things you want to look at is are you reinforcing that skill specifically? Um, and did you fade out too fast maybe? Um, do they need more reinforcement uh, on this skill until they master the skill? 
Now I mentioned these before, reinforcing attending and reinforcing approximations. So um, attending behavior, uh, you can operationally define it for your learner, um, but we are talking about things like they're looking um, in the direction of the instructions or at the materials. Um, they're waiting for instruction. Um, they are working quietly or um, they are ready for to receive information or looking for feedback. Um, but it, it would depend upon your learner what attending um, looks like. However, we don't want to stop reinforcing those like ready to learn behaviors and always follow ready to learn behaviors with difficult tasks because then those difficult tasks might actually function as punishers for being ready. So for example, if the learner, um, every time they are paying attention in class, I give them lots of work, um, then they might stop engaging in the paying attention type behaviors because the work is very hard or, and um, they, you know, and, and that's something that they don't want to engage in. Um, so what we want to do is that sometimes we are just reinforcing for those attending behaviors. Um, if your learner is operating on like a token system or something, that sometimes they just get tokens just for being ready. Um, that's a skill that they've learned. And that's a skill that we want them to continue to display is being ready for the lesson or being ready for the next activity. Um, so sometimes they're just going to get tokens just for being ready. They don't have to actually do the work yet to earn um, tokens or to earn access to um, some reinforcing activity, right? Same sort of thing with um, approximations. Um, even if we are not targeting specific approximations, if your learner is putting in the effort and the energy and they are trying, you can reinforce that sometimes. We want our learners to continue to try and you know the, to develop that persistence and to do their best. So we want to reinforce those behaviors of, of putting in the effort of trying, even if they get it wrong. Um, now we talked about needs to be delivered contingently. Um, so maybe your approximations would not have um, the same rate of reinforcement, right? Like I might reinforce um, targeted responses 100% uh, of the time, and I might reinforce approximations maybe 33% of the time. So about every three times um, that they try, even if they're not right, instead of just saying like, try again, or, or resetting it, I might, you know, say, hey, you've done really good. Here you go. Here's another token. Or, hey, you know, you've been working on this um, for a while. Let's take a break and let's go play for a little bit. And we'll come back in a little bit, right? So you're reinforcing those approximations because behaviors that don't contact reinforcement are not going to continue. So if we want our learners to keep attending and to keep trying, we have to reinforce attending behaviors and approximations. We also want to be careful that we are not allowing too many incorrect responses, um, especially when teaching a new skill. So we know that the most efficient way to, to teach is um, errorless. That's the most positive experience for the learner. Um, and our learners not practicing errors and they can learn um, more quickly. So we want to do that where our learner is not practicing too many errors, where they're not having those opportunities to get frustrated and upset because they don't get it. Um, if we are letting our learner respond independently or we are fading out our prompts and our support and our learner makes a mistake, then we want to go back in and support them so that they don't make more than one mistake in a row, right? Um, because multiple mistakes in a row can um, 
first of all, you can be practicing the wrong skill. Um, second of all, it can just lead to confusion and frustration for our learners because they they don't know how to do better. They already are trying. Um, so we need to jump in with more support. All right, reinforcers should be delivered quickly. We talked about that before. We wanna make sure that we are reinforcing the particular behavior as close in time um, to when it occurs as we can. Um, so let's talk about schedules of reinforcement. So a schedule of reinforcement refers to how often you deliver reinforcers. Um, there are uh, two uh, types of schedules and then two patterns. We'll call them patterns. Um, <laughs> so the two types, there are ratio schedules and there are interval schedules. Ratio schedules are going to be based upon the number of instances of the occurrence of that behavior. So think of it, I think a lot of times in the textbooks, they describe it as like making widgets, piecemeal work for each thing that you finish. Um, that is what counts. So if I am on a ratio schedule, then the number of widgets that I um, finish, um, that I complete, that's going to determine my reinforcement. Um, interval schedules, on the other hand, are based upon the first occurrence of the behavior after a specified time. So it's not just the specified time has to pass, um, but the behavior has to occur after that time window. So, um, so we'll give some examples here in a minute. So we have ratio and we have interval. Um, then both of those can be either fixed or variable. Fixed means it's going to be the same every time. It's a predictable pattern. In a uh, variable is means it's going to be different. Usually we talk about a variable. Um, schedule and we give it a number and that's going to be like the average. So let's talk through some examples. Um, fixed ratio schedules would mean that for a specific number of responses, the learner would get a, um, a reinforcer. So for every five responses, the learner gets a reinforcer. Um, and what it produces is a, uh, a rise run like stair step um, type of um, graph on a cumulative graph. The individual will um, uh, engage in the behavior. Then when they get their reinforcer, they're gonna pause and wait before they start again. And then they'll engage in all of those um, at one uh, quickly in succession so that they can get to the next reinforcer. A variable ratio means that it's going to be an average number. So sometimes every, if I said it's a variable ratio three, um, then sometimes the learner is going to get a reinforcer after every three responses, um, sometimes after two, after four, after one, after five, but it averages out to be approximately every third turn, um, every third behavior, uh, targeted behavior, that's when they get their reinforcer. Now, interval schedules, a fixed interval schedule means that there's a certain time window when reinforcement is not available, but the first response after that time um, ends, that is going to get the reinforcer. So um, let's say it's a uh, fixed interval schedule of five minutes. So once every five minutes, I could get the reinforcer and I'm going to get it the first time I press the bar, the first time I engage in that behavior after five minutes have passed. Um, so what you end up seeing on a cumulative record is a scalloped pattern. So the organism doesn't engage in the behavior. And then as it gets closer and closer in time to when the reinforcer is available, they start um, checking or they start engaging in that behavior more frequently in order to maximize so that the very first second that it becomes available, they are engaged in that behavior and can really maximize that reinforcer. So you get like this scalloped pattern um, as the uh, organism 
waits and then starts um, trying to be the first one, <laughs> uh, get that first response in when the time passes. Um, variable interval schedules um, would again be an average. So instead of five minutes, sometimes the window is three minutes, sometimes it's seven minutes, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six, but it averages out to five. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it for the ratio, variable ratio and variable interval, um, but variable schedules are going to produce uh, very stable responding because basically the learner is going to keep um, a regular pace um, because you never know when it might work, right? Um, so I'm just going to keep a consistent pace. It's not necessarily going to be as steep, um, but it's going to be very consistent um, in the pacing so that the um, organism is maximizing the reinforcers that are available. So it's important to know the schedules of reinforcement. Um, and then we can uh, look at what schedules of reinforcement um, our learners might be receiving. And in order to maximize um, uh, performance of a particular target behavior, then we might change the schedules of reinforcement. Generally speaking, um, when you're starting with a brand new skill, you want to start with a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. Every time that skill occurs, um, a fixed ratio of one, <laughs> so constant, um, continuous reinforcement. Every time that uh, target behavior occurs, then the individual gets the reinforcer. As you fade out with your goal being whatever um, natural reinforcement schedule is in place in the natural environment, as you fade out, you're going to want to shift to variable ratio um, and then start increasing and spreading it out. And the reason you want to shift to variable instead of stay on fixed is because variable produces stable responding. So we want our learners to be able to engage in skills um, even if sometimes the reinforcers aren't coming as frequently um, as they should because we can't always control um, uh, the whole environment and sometimes people may not reinforce behaviors that our learners um, are using and and so we want our learners to be persistent and to be able to continue to engage in those behaviors even if the environment is not necessarily reinforcing and supporting that behavior in that moment um interval schedules might be appropriate for um certain behaviors but um a lot of the behaviors that we teach are generally things that are per opportunity so ratio makes uh, a good uh, makes a lot of sense for those all right so the assignment that goes with reinforcement techniques uh, list and define the four ways to ensure reinforcer effectiveness. This is DISC. So what do D-I-S-C stand for? Um, explain why it's important to reinforce attending behaviors and approximations. Define the four types of schedules of reinforcement. So we just talked about fixed and variable, ratio and interval, um, and, and what those four combine to make. Um, identify the schedule of reinforcement used when initially teaching a new behavior. Explain the reasoning behind why would we change schedules of reinforcement once a behavior is learned. And then outline a plan for fading the schedule of reinforcement um, for something like one step instruction following. So where would we start and what would be our steps to fade out reinforcement systematically so that it then matches the natural environment. All right, so that is topic eight, reinforcement techniques. Um, if you'd like, you can type answers to the assignments in the comments, and I'd be happy to provide feedback. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop those in the comments and subscribe if you want to continue to see more of this series. Thank you so much. Bye.